Well, good afternoon, everyone. As William said, I have three Tuesdays here left with you until I return to the land where the sun shines. Um, and today, next week, I'm going to deal with the biggest of big questions. And the last Tuesday I'm here, I want to deal with the most confronting of the big questions. But today, as William said, I want to deal with the most difficult of the big questions, and that is the question of suffering. Uh, Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote that book, which was on the New York bestseller list for so many weeks, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And uh, it, it was his response, really, to the premature death of his young son, Aaron. It's very difficult to respond to issues of suffering, and in that particular case, if one hasn't experienced exactly that type of suffering. It's very easy in one's response, therefore, to minimise the issue of suffering if you haven't experienced it. And it's easy as well to show disrespect by throwing a cliche on the problem of suffering. Now, Rabbi Kushner's solution was to affirm that God is good, but he is not powerful. And he did therefore not make a perfect world, a perfect creation, and that we therefore need to forgive him. But the Bible says that God made a perfect creation. And the sort of God who needs to be forgiven by those whom he created is barely a God. So what is the answer to suffering? Why do we see so much seemingly random suffering around about us? And why do we experience that ourselves? I remember in Australia, it was 2006. It was Boxing Day, the day, uh, the very hot time. The Boxing Day test match was just starting up between Australia and Pakistan at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. And as I was lying back there, getting over the previous day's celebrations and watching the cricket, uh, there was a flash at midday. And it said that some sort of wave had hit Indonesia. By the end of that day, of course, we were all aware of what actually happened and a word entered into common English usage and the word was tsunami. How do you understand such a random event like that? On our TV screens in Australia, we are always moved when we see the bodies of British ex-servicemen come through what is now known as Royal Wooten Bassett. How do you cope with that sort of suffering. Well, all I have is the Bible, and the Bible is all I need, and the Bible doesn't answer all my questions, and that is good for me because it reminds me that I am to humble myself under God, and I do not walk by sight, but I walk by faith. And I also know from the Bible that God understands suffering because he saw his own son suffer. He loved us and gave himself for our sin. In our first parish, it was in the country area of Australia on a very flat plain. And because of its openness in the sky, there was a great telescope very near our church called the Kalgura Telescope. And it was a joint effort by NASA in the United States and the Australian government. And there was a program being promoted through Kalgura called SETI, S-E-T-I, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And they were putting together a record to put on the Voyager spacecraft, which would tell people out there about life on planet Earth. And uh, I think Voyager keeps going out, 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 and we're still waiting for a transmission to come back to see if there is intelligent life out there, SETI. And the question I have for you today is this. Through the tragic events of life and through suffering, is God transmitting a message? Let's see what the Lord Jesus says. Open your Bibles there to page 46. That's where we're going to start. In Luke chapter 12, verse 54, that section at the foot of the page headed, interpreting the times, Jesus says, you know how to interpret the weather. Uh, you, know, you know what it's going to be like. We're amazed at the BBC weather lady who comes on in the morning with a big smile on her face. She says, today is going to be sunny and there are going to be showers as well. Always those two come together. And yeah, I don't know how you read the weather here in England, but Jesus is addressing this issue in verse 54. You know. When the signs of the storms are coming, we know when the rain is coming. You know how to read the weather and you act appropriately. He then comes down in verse 57 and he says, let's say you have an accuser and that person takes you to the magistrate. 
What do you do? You very quickly sum up your position and your legal rights and whether or not you are in the right or the wrong. And if you're in the wrong, look at what he says, verse 58, as you go with your accuser before the magistrate, you make an effort to settle out of court with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer. So here are two examples. One, you know how to interpret the weather and in the light of your reading of the signs of the weather, you act appropriately. You know how to interpret your legal chances and in the light of your assessment of your legal chances, you act appropriately. You hypocrites, you know that Jesus says, but you do not know how to interpret the times. You hypocrites, verse 56, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but you do not know how to interpret the present time. So how do you interpret the present time? So someone said to him, look at chapter 13, verse one. Well, how do you interpret that act of political atrocity? those people who came from Galilee up to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. You cannot be more innocent, can you, than going to church. And yet Pontius Pilate interprets their coming from Galilee to Jerusalem as an act of political rebellion. He sends his soldiers out and they slaughter them and their blood is mixed with the blood of their sacrifices. How do you interpret that? People ask Jesus. And then if you look down to verse four, you will see, well, how do you interpret this industrial accident? Those 18 men who were building a tower in Siloam and the scaffolding collapsed and killed them. How do you interpret that? An industrial accident? A political atrocity? How do you interpret it? Look at what Jesus says. He says the same thing in verse 2 and verse 4. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Do you think there's some sort of automatic formula here that these people suffered like that because they were especially sinful? No, you cannot read life in terms of automatic formulas. Verse three and five provides the key. He repeats it. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. No, verse five, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. These events, Jesus says, the way to interpret these events, suffering events, is to see them that God is transmitting and his word that he is transmitting is repent. I mean, stop ignoring me. Stop going your own way. Stop living in my world as though I did not exist. Turn back. That's what I'm transmitting. Turn back because I am Lord and live under my rule. Now that needs more explanation, doesn't it? Someone said the Bible is in two parts, Genesis 1 to 3 and all the rest. And sure enough, in Genesis 1, 2 and 3, what do we see? That God created humankind and he put us in a paradise garden. And he said that your staying in that paradise garden is contingent upon your doing and recognizing my rule. You can eat the fruit of any tree, but not the fruit of that tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And humankind typically shook our fist at God said, we want your paradise, we want your garden, we simply don't want you. And we took of the fruit that was forbidden and ate it against the rule of God. And God said, therefore, well, to the woman, you will have pain in childbirth and friction in relationships. To the man, you will now battle your environment and work will be a grind. And you'll go back to the dust for from the dust you were taken, you will die. Now, how do you understand death? The secularists tell us it's natural. The romanticists tell us it's beautiful. But we believe as Christians that it's an obnoxious intrusion into the created order of God and death is a direct result of human rebellion that we shook our hand at God and God put us out of the garden. Now, what did God put them out into? An environment where there is pain, where there is friction, where there is struggle, and ultimately where there is death. And that is the result of the fact of human rebellion that humankind shook its fist at God. A number of years ago in Australia, we had a dreadful criminal act. Six men picked up a young nurse from a railway station in Sydney and took her out and eventually murdered her. 
The details of what happened were broadcast over the radio and the whole of society in Sydney was appalled at what those men did to that young lady. When they were found to be guilty, they were put away for life and their files were marked never to be released. Such was their animal conduct. Where were they put? They weren't put in a five-star hotel. They were put in a high security prison where every day when they looked through bars, it was a reminder to them that what they had done was wrong, that it was unacceptable to our society. And creation, friends, is like that. Oh, there are beautiful aspects of creation, but creation is marred. And the marring is a direct result of our human rebellion against God because we said no to God. And every time I go to a funeral and every time I go and see friction and pain and suffering, it's a reminder that we have done wrong. Creation is marred because of human rebellion. Well, is there hope? Yes, there is hope. Because the only one who had the right to stay in paradise, who perfectly obeyed God, took on flesh and came into this environment and gave his life in payment for the penalty and fine of human sin so that those who put their faith in him one day will be able to go back into the paradise garden of God. Is God transmitting? Yes, Jesus says, verse 3. Through these events of life, he's saying, come back. I didn't create the world to be like this. It is like this because of your choice to rebel against me. Come back. It's like this. Christmas this year, a great gathering of the family. Grandparents, parents, grandchildren. Lots of presents, lots of food. What a happy time. What's God's message around that table? I'm good to you. Repent and turn back to me. Christmas the following year, not so good. The economy's going backwards. The divorce court has come into question. Death has interrupted the family. What is God's message transmission to that table? Repent. It was never meant to be like this. But because of human rebellion, it is like this. What is God's consistent message as I sit and watch the news every night? Repent. Oh, there are good things. But there are things that confront me that I cannot explain that are hard things. And God is saying, repent, because you shook your fist at me. There's an Englishman by the name of Thomas Bradford, it was said, and I've put the quote there, when he saw or heard of any tragedy, he counted it as a thing due to his own sin and cried, Lord, have mercy on me. Well, that brings us to our parable. All that's by way of introduction. So now let's get into the parable. But we're, we're almost there. Don't worry. You'll be out on time. Verses 6 to 9. This is the whole point of the fig tree, isn't it? The fig tree in the middle of the vineyard. The fig tree is a symbol of Israel. And the master comes to the fig tree and he noticed that the fig tree is not bearing any figs. It's no fruit. The master inspects the fig tree. He inspects Israel. And what does he find? He expects to find in Israel the fruit of repentance, but he does not find there the fruit of repentance. So God says to the manager, cut the tree down. But the manager intercedes and says, oh, no, please, let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. Give it another 12 months. Give it more time to see if it will come. What's the parable about? It's about the fact that God's patience will not be endless. God is the owner. He comes and he inspects for fruit. Will he find the fruit tree bearing the fruit of repentance? That's what God is looking for. And there is an end to his patience. The opportunity for repentance one day, one day will pass us by. And so you are either the fig tree which needs to bear the fruit of repentance or you are that manager praying that others will repent, digging around and encouraging others to repent. Have you repented? And are you repenting? Or are you shaking your fist at God? Maybe not outwardly rebellious, but just ignoring him. He's got nothing to do with life the way I want to live life. God says, repent. I want relationship with you. I want you to come back to me. I know these two things. One, God is sovereign and he can do all things. And God is good 
and he loves and has good will, good will towards us. Because of human rebellion, our environment is less than he created it to be. And when we face up the deficiencies of our environment, it causes us to yearn for the perfection that is to come one day. We only know as much as the Bible tells us. The demand for intellectual satisfaction is there. Why is suffering so arbitrary? I don't know. I don't know. I've told you before about that story of that young man who came to a friend of mine who was the principal of a Bible college in Asia. He's got his five-year-old daughter draped across his arms. It's 10 o'clock at night. And he comes to the principal's house in the compound. He knocks on the door and he says, please help me. My daughter is ill. I have no transport. I have no money. I have no medicine. Please help me. And it's with that spirit of poverty, spiritually, that we must come to God. The poet put it like this. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Naked turn to you for dress. Helpless look to you for grace. Foul eye to the fountain fly. Wash me, saviour, or I die. I've got no reference. I've got nothing to commend me. I'm a spiritual pauper. I've got a record. But it's a record that condemns me. I've tried to live life without you. I've tried to be independent. But I now recognise that what Jesus says is true. He came into the world to do for me what I could not do for myself. And I entrust myself to you. The Bible calls that repentance and faith. And God promises you life and he promises you the hope and certain expectation that you will enter again into paradise. My friend, I don't know what life holds for you. I don't know what my experience in future years is going to be as I live outside the Garden of Eden. But whatever I face and whatever you face, I know that we will be better off if we face it with God rather than not having him. He knows what it is to suffer. He yearns for fellowship with you. And he simply says, in the light of the confronting suffering of life, repent, I'm transmitting, turn back. Let's pray. Uh, we thank you for the reality of this word because we recognise, our Father, that this does not minimise our suffering. It recognises it. We know that you are a God who sympathises with us in our suffering because you have been through it yourself. We thank you for this constant transmission repent. When he saw or heard of any tragedy, he counted it as a thing due to his own sin, his own rebellion, and cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. May that be our prayer today as we go back to work. Lord, have mercy on me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.